What's up, John? What's up, Kyer? Steve? Hey. How's it going? Nice yeah. to meet good. you. Good. How are you all doing? We're good. We're good, man. We're getting pumped. Right? Cool. So yeah, I just got show. back from a, a lunch, so we were running a little late, and I was like, God, I should push it back 15 minutes. Oh, it was perfect. We were in. This was perfect for me, too. Yeah, this was this was solid. Yeah, it gave me a little oh, more time to, time to mentally prepare, so it was nice. Um, yeah, we were at a Charlene's restaurant in Cape Breton eating fish chowder. That sounds delicious. <laughs> sounds way better than my morning. We had a uh, we had, I woke up this morning to a, we had a flood at Adapt. Oh like, no! Oh, up. So I like seven a.m. got an email like, "Hey, the bathroom's backing up into like the facility. You need to get your ass up here and <laughs> fix this." So yeah, so I've been up to my elbows and literally shit all morning. So Dang. I would much be eating fish chowder, man. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it all. Well, I hope where it's all are situated. you at? I'm in. Uh, I'm in Carlsbad. Oh, cool. Yeah, Is the that where you live. Um, so this. So I'm at our at Adapt today, and then I live down in uh, Cardiff. Oh, cool. Okay, okay. John's well. close, close by. Um, yeah, I was. I was just telling Steve, John, that I've uh, been a huge fan since I was eight years old, and yesterday Amazing. actually was my my thirtieth birthday. It was yesterday, so. What's that? 20. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. 20, 22 years of, uh, of just loving seeing you play and listening to your records. And so it's just really a dream come true to be able to chat with you and um, work together on this show. Um, it's funny how, how it really came about. John's, um, John's wife is childhood friends, best friends with my sister-in-law. And so um, he was talking about doing the, the show and talking about what kind of music and stuff and my first thing I said obviously was do we got to get Steve Poltz and his first thought was um before he even said anything was I was thinking about trying to get Jewel and I was like well oh wow yeah so it was really <laughs> it like, it it's, it's like we're on the right track we're on the right track yeah that's it was so crazy. cool yeah man so it's um yeah so we're super stoked November 10th at the belly up to have you back and glad it god we could work it all out and um one of my favorite, my favorite place to see a show, to play a show, such a beautiful space and um, for a great cause. So excited about it. Man, it's, I was on the radio yesterday, I think. Did you yeah. know that? Yeah, my mom called me because she's always listens to Dave Shelley and Chainsaw and she's like, Steve's on the radio talking about the show right now. She always hears when you're Oh, on, good. On. Cool. Yeah, I'm sure that was, yeah. that was good promo. Um, we don't have the hugest audience with my company yet, but it's really, it's growing and um, it's a, it's a nice local, local audience. So, so hopefully this gets some more people out too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Steve, how's, uh, how's Canada treating you? I know you've been out there for a little while. You're from Canada too, yeah? I was born, born up in Nova Scotia. So, um, but I grew up in Southern California, but we would go back a lot. And so I'm a dual citizen nice so all the shows have been crazy i think every i've never had a string of that many sold out shows in a row like 18 so straight so it's nuts and that's awesome well deserved. the reason today's cool is because i've been doing multiple nights in some of the cities so this is multiple nights so i'm in the same hotel right now that i it's so that's nice to not have to go best. anywhere right yeah. that's totally the best yeah you did three nights in halifax right you're your birthplace yeah so three nights at the carlton you guys would have so much fun there oh my gosh gotta Those make it out sometime. great i saw some of the, <laughs> the posts on instagram it looks awesome i've never i've never been up there i'm um i'm from toronto originally i'm not a dual oh, citizen oh, yet I didn't know still that, John. holding on to my canadian citizenship my <laughs> family's trying to get me to get my u.s citizenship so i'll sponsor them to live in the united states more permanently so like there's a bit of a oh, okay. function on me right now but yeah i'm from toronto so we got a little bit of shared canadian roots there i played I in a band with toronto. that right sky fucking line of toronto um yeah I, <laughs> I played in a band with these canadian brothers and their dad and canadian people just are they're a different breed i feel like they they have more fun than americans i guess i would agree i would agree <laughs> i feel like i feel like canada pumps out you know people people that are uh, very skilled in the arts across the board that's uh very creative creative bunch we are i can <laughs> live in toronto yeah, I really could live in Toronto. It's I love that city. 
Yeah, um, Toronto's, it's got it's, everything. It's cool. I don't know if I could go back now, like, you know, being in San Diego for the last, I don't know, what, 15, 16 years. I don't know that I could go back. I'm just like deconditioned to any sort of climate change other than, you know, 65 or above 75. <laughs> I'm, totally hosed, <laughs> I'm totally hosed. But yeah, Toronto's a good spot. That's a good spot. Yeah, That's I live awesome. in Nashville now. So um, Nashville gets really hot. And I sure miss good weather. Yeah. Right. How's, <laughs> gotta be, gotta how's be close to all the songwriters though, right? Nashville's, Nashville's changed a lot in the last like 10 years or so though, hasn't it? Like I had a buddy that went to Vanderbilt. I'd go out to Nashville maybe like four or five times a year. And like, we used to go down to the stage and like hit sort of like the Nash Vegas scene. And it was, it was like, cool. It was awesome. We had a ton of fun. And then I feel like over time that really caught on and everybody like tourists just flocked and now anybody that I feel like that lives in Nashville never goes down there if they can avoid it other than maybe to play a show or something like that um I don't go downtown the locals don't go down to Broadway yeah really it would be like if you lived in Vegas you wouldn't go to the strip yeah but I live in East Nashville and East Nashville is really cool and there's so much happening so many cool little spots to play that's and awesome. everybody lives there. Everybody's just doing it at a level like how I'm doing it, like always on the road, always writing songs. So I feel like I'm with my tribe of people. But I miss San Diego, obviously, because the reason you said, but right. I sure am having fun there. <laughs> That's nice. awesome. Man. I was just uh, over in Australia actually getting to play and met this um, Lily May and her, her brother and her. They just got married, her husband, Craig, Craig Smith um nashville locals are you friends with them yes yeah. i love them they're so yeah, amazing they're and, yeah they're amazing um seems like such a great community there and just like just like kind of how people from here have to move to la sometimes because that's where all the people are at it's just maybe the weather's not the best but it's really just the place to be and you're always on the road anyways so what were you doing in australia i was playing music actually um i'm so blessed man um it's uh it's kind of a kind of a long story but in 2012 I went to the Joshua Tree Music Festival for the first time because me and my uh, girlfriend at the time both won tickets through this band Howlin' Rain that I'm a huge fan of and that I actually now just joined a couple of years ago and um, dude it was like Barnett and that community there they're just it's my favorite people ever and since then I've all I've been trying to do is kind of create that community here and do similar things. And uh, so Howlin' Rain, the band, I, I just joined them. And um, we were actually the first band to go over to Australia, I think, like at the, since the pandemic. And um, it was amazing. It was, do you know BT, the promoter? Um, yeah. So yeah, we, we, I, was, I was talking to him about you a little bit. He, um, so he brought us out. He saw the band in Austin, Texas, 10 years ago. And he's like, I'm going to bring this band out one day. And then finally worked out. And um, I've been hearing you talk about Australia since I was a kid and listening to the records you made there and everything. And it really is such a magical place, man. And the people are just like, every show was sold out and the ticket prices are way higher. So they just really value music there. And um, yeah, I got to, you know, he, he loves, he loves Lily May and all that country stuff and, and everything. And his fest, we played at his festival, Boogie Fest. And it was really like, the most diverse lineup of music it was basically just whatever's going on in bt's head you know it's like what is he like okay it didn't like it was the coolest thing and i feel so blessed and yeah it was really cool meeting he's lily. great man yeah. you're with the right guy he's really <laughs> cool and then lily may and craig play in jim lauderdale's band right. and i just wrote 15 songs with jim Did so we're you? gonna do a duo yeah we're gonna do a duo record that we're working on through compass records we were that's our next project is to oh do that gosh. together. And then I started my own festival in Joshua Tree with Barnett as my partner. Right. But so Barnett's my partner. Right? Yeah. And so that's crazy. So I was really bummed I couldn't go to that. We're all together. Right. <laughs> right. I know I was so bummed I couldn't go. I really wanted to do the songwriting school too, but my schedule is a little crazy. So um, wow. I was bummed. But yeah, I was so stoked when, when you guys announced that. I'm like, of course, Barnett one of the best people ever recognizes like yo we got to give steve that's his own so festival. cool <laughs> so do you guys um all work for adapt 
or is that John's? Thing? That's John's thing. John, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about Adapt. Yeah, sure, sure. So, um, yeah, so so Kyer and I are just sort of friends, you know, like like he was mentioning. My my wife is good friends with his brother's wife. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> my family tree makes my head explode. Like as soon as right. I go beyond either my wife or my parents, like my head just sort of melts. Um, but yeah, so. It's starting in, I guess it was like in 2009, um, we did, like we, I like to do one fundraiser a year for Adapt. I don't like to do a ton of fundraising and, you know, you know, poach all of my, you know, all of my network to try and like throw money down multiple times a year. So I try and do like one, one sort of bigger fundraiser per year. And we started in 2018, we did a casino night and it, it was always sort of my goal to put on a show with the belly up. I was like, I would love to, like, that would be the most legendary mm -hmm. fundraiser to do. So in 2019, we I we pulled the trigger and we did our first show at the belly up and it was just like a bunch of local kind of covers and stuff and it was super stressful and you know we got as many people there as I possibly could but it, it turned out great it was a lot of fun we did like a lip sync karaoke thing I did the Napoleon wow. Dynamite dance and like basically like we after each performance everybody like threw their bid cards up in the air to like you know donate money for who they thought was the best that i didn't oh, wow. win. i lost to this like quadriplegic guy who came out in a power chair and sang the dance by garth brooks <laughs> like so spot on that everyone was like is he actually singing or is he lip syncing this and um, it was it was intense it was super intense but it was it was awesome and we had a great time and we raised some good money and like i just felt like I love the belly up venue and um, I just love music and I am not musically inclined whatsoever, but you know, I walk around singing all the time just because, you know, I love music, but unfortunately I was not blessed with that gene. Um, and then COVID hit. And then basically we haven't done a fundraiser for, you know, two years. So 2020, 2021, we didn't do any fundraising. We had to close the facility for, and I'll tell you more a little bit about the facility and just sort of what we do in a sec, but we had to close for basically six months. We didn't lay off or furlough any of our staff. We kept everybody employed wow. um, just because like, they wouldn't find any other employment and they're very, very specialized people. And if we sort of let this tribe break apart, like it would be really hard to put it back together. So wow, like, that's beautiful. we kind of looked at it as our responsibility to make sure everybody stayed together, even though we weren't really able to do anything. Um, and weather the COVID storm. And now we're sort of back. Like this has sort of been the first full year of us actually being back doing what we do. Um, so background, that's just sort of our fundraising and how the belly up and everything came back together. And I, and when, it, when we realized that events were still going on, concerts were happening again, like I reached out to Beth and Chad at the belly up and I was like, hey guys, like, uh, I, I couldn't think of a better place to, to do my venue, to do our next fundraiser. We did a couple little things with the belly up during COVID just to kind of like keep ourselves busy. But, um, but yeah, so then, uh, so then we locked in the date and then Steve, you were gracious enough to, to work with us and I'm, I'm, I'm blessed and I'm stoked to, to have you. And I think it's going to be awesome. Um, backstory on adapt and sorry if I'm talking a lot, but um, backstory on adapt I started, my wife and I started the organization in 2017. And um, what we do is just, we do rehabilitation services for people with chronic neurological conditions. Um, what that means is, you know, you can think like exercise, physical therapy, occupational therapy, massage therapy, electrical muscle stimulation, mental health, emotional wellness, like individual therapy, group therapy, meditation, mindfulness. Uh, and then we do community development, you know, social isolation prevention. So like in general, we think if we can keep everybody's body working and functioning as long as we can and as much as we can, if we can take care of their mental health and give everybody a positive outlook on their quality of life, regardless of what their physical situation is or regardless of what the prognosis is for their condition. And if we can build a social circle around everybody so that they've got friends to share experiences with and they can get out in the community and actually do stuff, then holistically, we can make a pretty profound impact on their overall quality quality of life. Because a lot of people, you know, they get diagnosed with a chronic disease or a chronic neurodegenerative condition, or they go through an injury where they break their neck, they break their back. And um, unfortunately, they just, they stop moving, they stop exercising, they, they, they get depressed, they get down, their family and their friends kind of break apart, they don't really understand, they get isolated. And you think about everything that's not happening in a doctor's office, 
those are the things that are really, really, truly impactful on somebody's quality of life. So we try to bring everybody, bring those three things back into like the forefront of people's lives and try and change their quality of life. Why did we start doing this in the first place? My, um, my wife was diagnosed with MS in 2004. And so we've been on this battle for almost 20 years. And um, Kyra, you've known Melanie long enough now that you've kind of seen what this, the toll that this has taken on her. She started when I met her, she was, you know, young, vivacious, completely functional, like you would never know. And like you fast forward here to today, like, physically like the conditions taking a toll on her and i mean she's she's progressed significantly despite what's out there medically and sort of frontline disease therapeutics and and the one thing that like so the thing that we found to be most beneficial were those three things because if you change your outlook on your on your life regardless of what your situation is um that means you have a good life and so um yeah so i guess in a nutshell that's that's what we do and why we do it so and how's she doing now She's doing, she's doing okay. I mean, she's continuing to, to progress physically, you know, I mean, she's, she's on a walker probably like at the event, we'll see if she's on a walker or wheelchair. She's kind of at that, that point has some pretty gnarly fatigue issues. Um, So yeah, I mean, it's, there's a lot of, there's, it's, it's honestly, guys, it's like, it's the most trying thing that I've done in my life is just helping her navigate this, this journey. And then we work with a lot of other people that are going through really similar things. We've got a huge ALS program at at ADAPT. So we work with those clients all the time. We work with a lot of young people that have gone through like, you know, C-level quadriplegia, spinal cord injuries. And we work in getting them sort of back into living life again. And like, um, it's heavy work, but it's, it's, it's gratifying. And, and it's something that I never thought would be like the forefront of my life. Um, but it is, and we're just trying to make the best of it and raise awareness, but also really just, you know, have a good time and show everybody that just because you've got one of these conditions doesn't mean that you can't enjoy your life and have a good life experience. And she has MS, did you say? Yeah, she has and- MS. Do people come to adapt that have cerebral palsy? Oh yeah. 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 Yep. We've got a large, a pretty large CP population. Pretty much like we're we're if you've got a neurological condition, we try to be agnostic to what condition it is. I mean, we might tailor our approach, but generally everything that we do is is pretty much applicable across the board. Wow. That's intense. It's nice to hear your backstory. Um, and is that, did you start ADAPT? Is that your company or? Yeah. Is- so, yeah. So ADAPT is, uh, so we started ADAPT in 2017. So that's the way. Okay. In 2017. Yeah. You'll yeah, have to so check it out, Steve. It's a, a beautiful facility and it's cool. It's cool. It's very non-clinical. We try to make it sort of as organic as possible. We've got about 10 people on the team that are focused on rehab and recovery it's a charity. It's a 501c3. So I, I've never taken a dime out of the place. I've invested, I put money into it. I just want to give all of this team a platform to do what they do best. Cause we've got an amazing team that is like basically just dedicated their entire lives to helping people with the most challenging incurable conditions. And that's just, it's a rare breed of people that dedicate their craft to that. And then the people that are getting help are just, you know, they're amazing people too. They're gracious. They're, um, they're incredible. They've had some incredible stories. They've overcome a lot of incredible trials and some of them are facing terminal illnesses and they've got the most incredible attitudes that you could ever imagine. You know, they're like, I'm never going to have a bad day because I don't have any days I have left. It's just, it's inspiring as all hell. It's, it's, do you have another job you do too, or is that your full-time thing? I do. Yeah. I've worked in, I've worked in software for, um, about almost 20 years, 15 years. So I found an angel pretty much. That's my, that's, <laughs> yeah. my, that's my, that's what allows me to do what I do on the adapt front. And, um, I just, I probably stay busier than my wife likes me to. So <laughs> well, that's a whole nother <laughs> rabbit hole we can go down, but, um, but yeah, so that's that's the, that's our story, man. And it's well, um, I hope we sell a lot of tickets to this show. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we've sold some already. I haven't checked, but 
Yeah, we've we've well, sold some. I mean, we've we've sold like 70 or so so far. Um good. I was putting my little guest list together last night, which was just like growing, <laughs> growing with like it was 11 o'clock at night. And I was just typing out the names of everybody that I need to get to the show. And I think there's probably another 100, 150 at least on my list that I'll be bringing in. But um but wow. yeah, sell, let's sell some more tickets and, you know, get some people really going into in the DSC show on the morning of the show, too. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. That's I think, uh, I think that'll I'm help. sure that's an awesome. Ticket. Yeah, that's always good for 100 tickets. Nice. nice. That show. Nice. It's crazy. And that's then amazing. yesterday I was on the air with him, which is really cool. Um, and that was a really good interview. So, right. yeah. San Diego will get going, you know. They will. They will. People regardless, we're gonna have a good time, man. Like that's that what I care about is like I want to have a good time. I want to I want to let put on some good music and have some fun. And I think we're gonna do that one way or another. That's what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> and both you guys are are such angels in in this world and do so much for for changing so many people's lives obviously john with what all the amazing things you're doing at adapt and steve with inspiring people with your music and with your with your actions like i um when we, when i was nine or ten um my best friend one of my best friend then chase and his dad who turned me on to you you went to the padre game with them you know like took this like little kid to the padre game and like those sort of things and like talking to people after just really change people's lives for the entirety of their life you know and make me and other people who experience that want to be the best people they can be and um everything and it's just like both you guys inspire me so much to to do good in my life so i just really thank you both so much well thank you're, you you're a good dude Kyra. you're a really good dude <laughs> thanks John. i appreciate uh, it you've got to get us uh, <laughs> to get us this far and you know put the show i'm on, super so. lucky man i mean so my, do i get to meet yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, um, hopefully, if you want to cut. So, so tonight we're. This is our studio. Um, Papa Leo's just. He's bringing some stuff in. So my friend Zach, his dad, is one of the best people ever too. He um he actually had a production company and they put on. I think it was like seventy five shows at the La Paloma in the seventies, which was like included the Ramones, wow. Gary Garcia band. Like it's it was it was insane. Um, and he's allowed us to build out this studio here. And, and what we do is we host this podcast and we have on different musicians and then different people who have different nonprofits or we've had on, you know, local, um, our friend is on the city council for Encinitas now. And we just try and bring the community together and um, like inspired by, you know, the people out in Joshua Tree too. It's just, it's all about connecting the dots and there's so many great people doing so many great things. And we want to showcase that. And, um, Tiny Desk, NPR Tiny Desk is one of my biggest inspirations. So we try and have a very diverse musical um, lineup here. We've done like an experimental brass band to a 16 piece timba band to singer songwriters to, you know, tonight we have um, a nine piece band that I actually play bass with. This 21 year old kid who's absolutely unreal, virtuosic guitar player, singer, songwriter. And um, so we're gonna, we're gonna be live streaming that. and. Um, my little brother's a skate filmer and he just made a part um, for Red Bull with his friend Alex Sorgente that came out on Monday. So he's going to be our guest. We're going to chat about that. And um, yeah, so it'd be awesome um, to have you both on the podcast. Um, we'd love to, to film it when you're here. And um, that's sort of, that's what I lo love to do. We started at our old studio filming, filming bands um, with our, my other friend, Andrew Ware. Um, who I think he, um, I think you're friends with his buddy Aaron Dennis's dad. Something like Aaron. Yeah, had, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. So they had a band, Tan Sister Radio, back in the day, and our bands would play together um, from elementary school. I remember Tan Sister Radio. Oh, they were so great, man. They were so, yeah. uh, so unique and original. <laughs> and we would put yeah. on these shows at the Elks Lodge in Cardiff, um, and they would just be the most fun <laughs> things. So Andrew, he couldn't make wow. it today. He wanted to say what's up to you today, but he, uh, he's working right now. Um, wow. Yeah, so and will I get to meet John's wife? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, she's oh, good. I want to meet her. I would love to meet her. And, um, cause she's your inspiration. I love stories is, like man. that. She is, she is. 100%. Melanie. 
yeah, Melanie's Melanie's awesome. She's <laughs> yeah, she's awesome. I I couldn't like all the shit she's going through. I couldn't imagine somebody like if it were happening to to me, I would never have the attitude that she has. And I hate saying that, but it's true. Like she just all she wants to do is just make people laugh. That's the only, like she just wants to be around people that make her laugh, and she just wants to try and make people laugh. That's like her goal in life is just to like make people smile and laugh, and that's it. And like she's going through some of the hardest stuff that you could ever imagine, and all she wants to do is laugh and make other people laugh. And yeah, she's 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 a blessing of a human being for sure. Well, I'll get in the night before that show because I'm coming in from somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where, but I I. I do like 300 shows a year. So I'm, I've been on this crazy run right now across Canada of uh, everywhere. And then um, I'll be going back to Australia in March, but it'll be cool to be in San Diego. I get in on November 9th. So okay. I'm excited. Nice. And then I'm free all day on the 10th. So awesome. maybe I can meet her. Yeah, that'd be yeah. cool. Yeah, we'll we'll make we'll make either the ninth or the tenth work for sure. I know. Um, yeah, if you guys, if I don't know what time you get in on the ninth, but if you want to grab some dinner or something like that, we could do that. Or um, you know, something. Yeah, else. that'd be cool. All right, that'd be great. Yeah. I had this friend that uh, was a marine, and he stepped on a landmine and got his two legs and an arm blown off. And so I was with him when he was going through that rehab. And he's got two prosthetic legs on now and learned to walk again. And whenever I see people that overcome these adversities, it's pretty crazy because his spinal injury was horrible, you know, and yeah. everything that happened to him. And it's amazing what everybody goes through. So that's really neat that you're doing something and, you know, you're affecting change. And like it's from what I was reading about, it seems like a lot of people can't afford this kind of care and so it's important that they have they know they have this available to them and they have the opportunity to somehow improve step by step yeah yeah i think that's that's a that's a big part of it and it's a big part of the problem that we have right now it's just you you go through one of these conditions and you a lot of times lose your job and then you're working you know you're living on the government and then you basically you need you have more expenses than if you were healthy and you can't get gainful employment, you need stuff like what we do. So yeah, we've, we've since 2017, we've given away over a million dollars in grant services to our, um, to our patients just so that they can come and wow. rehab, you know, with, and that range is like from people that just get 10 or 20% discounts all the way to people on just sort of full ride grants that just come and they don't have to pay a dime out of pocket. Do people, um, does insurance cover some of this stuff for people or is it one of those things where they're left in the weeds and they're like, well, sorry, and it's this dirty secret nobody knows about? Yeah, it's, it's so they'll cover a little bit. So it's, insurance basically will cover about 12 to 13 sessions of physical therapy and that's it per year. So if you think about somebody who's got a spinal cord injury needs to do probably four to six hours a week with us in facility, that would be, that would be six sessions of physical therapy that have basically been exhausted in one week. So that would give you roughly two to three weeks of, of rehab. Whereas. Oh you know, my people, God. Yeah. Most of then our clients, what would they be charged? Uh, well for us, yeah, our, our out of pocket is like 120 bucks an hour. So it's not crazy expensive. I mean, compared to like, that's a lot of money for somebody every oh. day, if they're going six days a week oh, yeah, for yeah. them to come up with. Totally. So what you're talking about is somebody would then end up getting, having to come up with $600 a week for something like, say they had, um, MS or cerebral palsy, or had a spinal cord, some traumatic injury, they're needing to go five days a week, maybe you're saying? Yeah. So someone with MS two to three days a week um, for one to two hours at a time, someone with spinal cord injury, two to three days a week for two hours at a time. Um, and that's not including mental health. That's not including massage therapy. I mean, you're looking at probably like whether you work with us or anybody else, you're probably looking at an incremental cost of 1500 to $2,500 a month in just rehab services. Wow. And you and, help people, wow. and you help people um, 
no, like with that, right? The, the, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that. yeah. That's what our that's what our scholarship program. That's what we're wow. raising money for. Like all the money that we raise for the event is going to our scholarship program, so that we can keep providing those services at a nominal cost or limited out of pocket funds for people. And are you able to get like um, corporate sponsors to chip in? Yeah. Yeah. So we have, your contacts, I mean, because you're kind of in a business world as well and wearing two hats. Yeah. So we've we've got a good amount of support from the pharmaceutical industry. Like they're just in the last two years, they've really started to kind of take a liking to what we do. And they're starting to get a little bit more diversified when it comes to like how they think about patient care. So it's wow. not just let's pump drugs and medicine into people. It's let's look at the total person and actually figure out what they need to live a better life medication being one of those things but they've started to put a lot more funding into things like programs like ours like that's how we're able to have such a big als program we have a pharmaceutical sponsor that basically funds anybody who's diagnosed with als to come through our programs and they don't have to pay anything out of pocket for that so that's something that we started in 2020 with ionis pharmaceuticals who's in our backyard and we've grown that program pretty significantly over the last three years and um, yeah, and we've got a couple of corporate sponsors for the event as well. So they've chipped in to be able to make us, you know, allow us put this on and, you know, raise some money for some folks. And yeah, it's been good. And so your biggest donor is Ionis, you would say that really backs you heavily? Um, biggest donor would be me. And then <laughs> <laughs> I've got, to, I take, I take responsibility for keeping the lights on. Um, but then beyond that, it's, um, yeah, Ionis and then, uh, Biogen are our two sort of biggest industry donors. Oh, okay. And can you also tell me something about, cause I find this fascinating. It's something sure. I didn't think about. Um, the mental health part, because you're right, you would think if you were diagnosed with something, I didn't even think of like, there's like a whole butterfly effect of repercussions, not only is your body, your body, I'm sorry, your body having to deal with these changes, but also uh, do people suffer like, is it like a depression or oh. is that what you're talking about? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and sometimes it can be condition related if you have, um, damage like something like ms for example like you can you can get an ms exacerbation in a part of your brain that would actually cause you to have depression but more often than not you go through one of these conditions like you're dealing with losing everything that you used to be able to do right like if you break your back or break your neck and you know imagine like not to be a downer right but imagine if you broke your neck and you were never able to play guitar again a lot of people go through that. I had one guy who played a, um, a God, it was a, a type of harp. He was a professional. Wow. Um, I can't remember what it was called. His name was John Doan. Um, I can't remember the instrument he used to play, but he played it professionally and it was it, incredibly intricate. And then he had a couple strokes and he lost his ability to play. So, you know, you go through the the experience of loss and loss of all of like the physical things that you love to do or just the loss of oh i'm in a wheelchair or i can you know I'm, I'm different than everybody else i have to make all these accommodations why can't i just go to the bathroom normally anymore like all of those types of things start to compound and then it takes a huge mental health toll on people or if you get diagnosed with als and you're dealing with the prospect of like i maybe only have one or two years left to live like what's my family going to do what are my kids going to do all of that kind of stuff so that is an incredibly like, critical piece of the puzzle, right? You have to accept your situation for what it is. And then you have to learn tactics to be able to, you know, be grateful for what you do have and not, not mourn and long for what you've lost or what you don't have, or be afraid of what's in front of you, um, but sort of live more in the present and live for today. And another interesting little sort of tangent to that is, most of our clients want some sort of physical um, rehabilitation, right? So if you're in a wheelchair, you have a spinal cord injury, you want to learn to walk again, you know, or if you've got MS, you want to learn how to walk better or whatever that may be, you want to prevent decline. And if you come into a rehab program, depressed, down, negative, pessimistic, and then you say, I want to get better, 
Well, if you think about movement, everything that you do, whether you're using your fingers, whether your heart's beating, your breathing, like voluntary or involuntary, it all originates as a thought in your brain. It all originates as a thought in your brain. And if your brain, if your mindset is coming from a place of negativity, pessimism, um, you know, whatever it might be, depression, everything that happens downstream from that is going to be impacted by that state of mind that you're in. So you're actually going to impact your ability to physically recover in a negative way if you're coming at life and rehabilitation from a negative perspective. So getting people into a balanced, emotionally positive, or at least neutral state of mind is important on the physical side as well, because it is, it is correlated and it is connected. And um, is that something as well that's similar to what insurance would cover for sessions of that type of thing, like mental health? Like mm. they, they they do, but mental health coverage from insurance is awful. They, I mean, they'll they'll you think about, I mean, a therapist and in in a cheap therapist, this is one hundred and fifty dollars an hour. You know, a therapist can go two, three, four, five, six hundred bucks an hour, depending on. Wow. Who and insurance i mean i think we we went to go see a therapist once or twice melanie and i did um that was that was referred to us by the hospital and i think that the guy billed us like 400 bucks for an hour and we Whoa. submitted it for reinsur insurance reimbursement and they kicked us like 40 bucks <laughs> and they were oh, like yeah, boy. Yeah, the other 360 is is your responsibility and it's just kind of like how is that tenable for anybody? Right. So, That's crazy. yeah. And does ADAPT have like a full time psychologist on staff or yeah, how we do have, you guys um, handle that? Yeah, we have three of them. So, you have three full time because I find that interesting the mental health part. So, you have three people there. Wow. That sounds like it's even just a, almost more important than the physical because if, you're, if your I mind's agree. not good. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, it, like it, it's definitely just as important if not more important so we have we have three therapists on staff um it's funny our, our mental health lead like absolutely loves you steve by the way <laughs> like, oh good <laughs> yeah like every time you come to san diego she's like a hundred percent all in making sure she's got tickets she's like hey john can you get me tickets to go see steve for the uh for his birthday shows i'm like yeah of course michelle we'll make sure you get tickets to steve so um there's a lot but of anyway, those fans around here. Yeah. So <laughs> she's um, so we have we have three therapists that basically they're not all full time, but we basically have at least one, one person here every single day of the week that's doing mental health. And um, it's funny because it's not so you'd think that the person who's going through the affliction, obviously they've got their own challenges. But what we start to see too is that the family members that are aff affected by whatever that individual is struggling with, whether it's, you know, a lot of it is ALS and these neurodegenerative conditions, like the, the mental health is, and like therapy is, is almost just as important for them too, because many times people's roles transition to where they start as a partner and a husband or a wife or whatever. And then somebody gets diagnosed with this type of a condition or they go through like a life-changing injury that's completely debilitating. And now they have to take on a new job and that's a care, caregiver, caretaker. And they have to provide, you know, food. They have to help them with bathing. They have to help them with bowel bladder. They have to help them with getting dressed in the morning. They have to help them with transfers. You know, they have to be there all the time. And then a lot of times, like if you look at some of these progressive conditions that are not a spinal cord injury, where it's not, you know, this flip of a light switch where you go from, you know, point A to point B, but you're actually on this sort of like slow journey of decline. That's really, really hard on family and, uh. and partners and spouses because it's, it's constantly a moving target, the type of care that you have to give. And then a lot of times it becomes more and more and more involved and, um, they need help too. They need support as well. Because if, if the caregiver and the support infrastructure for the person who's suffering isn't solid, then again, their rehabilitation and anything that they're going to do to try and have a more positive outlook on life is going to suffer. So it's just as important for us to make sure that not only the patient or the, you know, the person who's going through the condition has mental health 
services and, and like has a positive outlook, but their family needs that too. Wow. So that's a big component of our programming and just and how we help people and what we do. But yeah. Man, that's crazy. I didn't even think of the whole ripple effect of them, the people around the person who it happens to. And also, like you said, so what are the diseases that are more that continue to go downhill? Is that like um ALS, obviously? Yeah, ALS and MS are the two the two big ones. ALS is more aggressive. So, you know, if you get diagnosed with ALS, you, you basically have um on average two to four years where you go from full function to like we had we had one client. Sorry, this is the downer, but like we had one client who was diagnosed with ALS and he got to the point where he had to tape his eyelids shut at night because they wouldn't close and he couldn't go to sleep without doing that. So the, basically oh. the volitional movement you have left is your eyes, um, two to four years and it's, it's terminal condition, no cure. What and about then, Parkinson's? Do you do that? Have we do. People with that? Yeah. yeah. We've got a decent amount of folks with Parkinson's that come through here. Gosh. Um, basically, basically anything neurological, um, anything neurological, and that can be disease-based or injury-based. Um, we can see a lot of traumatic brain injury. Um, the, the acute injuries tend to be a little bit more stable. Um, you know, you get hurt and then you're basically adjusting to life at a new ability level. Um, things like MS, ALS, they tend to be neurodegenerative. So over time, you can either, some people plateau, some people just sort of, you know, things go into remission with MS and they can kind of actually get a little bit better. But in general, it's, it's, it's kind of like a very slow burn for 20 or 30 years of um, decline. And so it's our job to just sort of prolong that as much as possible, you know, maintain function as long as possible, maintain quality of life, you know, positive outlook on quality of life and what your life is. And um, just try and, and try and get people doing things again too. You know, that's, that's another really challenging thing, especially like the condition, these types of conditions too, they're not all just physical. Like there's fatigue that sets in, there's, you know, like just bowel bladder disrupts people's lives significantly. So when you see those things start to like come to fruition, a lot of times they're like, well, I don't want to leave my house and I don't want to leave the proximity to the bathroom. So I'm not going to go do all this stuff. And so it's, it's, I look at it as our job. It's not just about what you do in the center. It's about preparing you and giving you the confidence and independence to go out and do something else. Like go to the Padres game or go to the belly up and see a show or get out in the ocean and do some adaptive surfing. There's lots of awesome organizations that'll take anybody into the water and get them on a, you know, an adaptive surfboard and let them get in the ocean for a while. Like it's our job, I think, to, to prepare people for those types of experiences so that they can actually have a, like a life experience that they can hold on to that can build up reserves. So we have, um, we have this, everybody has this, this thing called cognitive reserve or neuronal reserve, which is basically, you can think of it as your resistance to um, your resistance to call it like depression, your resistance to sort of giving up. And that is strictly correlated, it's correlated to the number of positive life experiences that you have. And this is something that they've studied. And so the more reserve you can build up, the more resilience you actually have to decline in your function, and that reserve is built up through positive life experiences and doing things that are productive and make you feel good and make you feel whole. It could be singing, it could be playing music, it could be going to a show, it could be getting in the ocean, it could be traveling, it could be interacting with friends, but anything that's basically lifting you up and giving you positive life experience builds up neuronal reserve in your body and in your brain. And that gives you resilience to decline and progression over time. So. Another reason why we kind of try and put all of these things into place in somebody's life. So, man, this is amazing. So, what is your goal through this show? Like, what it what do you want to see happen? Um, I just honestly, Steve, like, I want to have a good. I want to put on a good show and have everybody that shows up have a great time. Like, that's priority number one. Priority number two. That's easy. 
Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I, can, I can help you with that. I can help you with that part. Okay. Okay. Check. Um, priority number two, I think, I mean, fundraising, right? What the, the reason we're doing the show is, is, is a fundraiser. Um, we've got some corporate sponsors that have thrown some money in. I want to, I want to raise some money through ticket sales. So the more people that we can get there, the better, um, I'm going to do a little bit of fundraising at the show. So I'm going to take maybe 10 or 15 minutes to talk to everybody that's there. I'm going to show a little video that we're having made on everything that, um, that adapt does. And then, um, I'm going to give everybody who's there an opportunity to contribute. Um, I'm not going to do anything super forced, like, you know, Hey, auction, throw your bid number up in the air and, you know, give me 10 grand or any of that kind of stuff. I just personally, I don't feel like the economic climate is right for that right now. Um, I think everybody, I want it first and foremost to be about like, Hey, if you bought a ticket, that's awesome. Like that is, that is your contribution to our cause. And if you can and want to do more while you're here, we would absolutely love that too, but no pressure, no obligation. I just don't want anybody to feel like, you know, we're trying to get our fingers in their wallets any, you know, uh, unnecessarily, but I am going to talk a little bit about adapt, show a bit of a video, and then I'm going to give people probably like 10 or 15 minutes until your set starts to, 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 to make a donation. So we're going to have a bunch of like little table tents around with QR codes. We'll have some QR codes up on the screen that they can go to and they can just pump a donation and we'll have like a little point of sale in the back where if somebody wants to go and, you know, make a contribution, they can do that too, but it'll be pretty low pressure. Um, and then, yeah, then, and then just uh, want everyone to have a good time. And that's, and that's pretty much it. Well, is there, if there's anything else I can do to help you, like it'd be cool up on the day of the show. Cause I'm going to go do the DSC show in the morning. Then maybe I could stop by and check out adapt, you know? Oh, really? I would love that. I would love that. that would yeah. Be that was my favorite to. coffee place is I'll get a coffee right across from the belly up at lofty and then cruise up there. Oh man, you know. I love Lofty. Lofty is yeah, so, <laughs> that is so good, <laughs> right? And then I could come by there, and then I'll be at the belly up. I think we'll get good ticket sales. San Diego usually comes out to support, so I think, I think so it'll too. be good. Yeah, I think so too. Like I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked, and I just, I want to have a good time. I'm, I'm trying not to put too much pressure on myself to like make this, you know, to, to control every aspect of it. Um, and I just, yeah, I want to have a good time, make a little bit of money for our organization and for, for our clients and set up something that like my goal too would be that like, I would love for, for what we do at the belly up to be something that I just, I do every year and we just do a benefit concert. And that is our, that is our main fundraising mechanism. So I would love this also to just be a platform, the belly up platform, the, the annual benefit, just something that we can build off of for, you know, going forward for years to come. Yeah. That poster is so cool. That Scrojo made. Oh, right. he crushed it, didn't it? Oh, right. So good. It's like one of my favorite ones he's done. And he's made so many posters over the years of my shows. Right. I I wrote I texted him even personally and said, dude, you like <laughs> outdid yourself on this. It's so cool. Right. It's so good. We're gonna it have so some good. printed up. So we'll we'll if you want one, we'll give you one. Oh I uh, do. Yeah. No, I will yeah. I will make sure there's one for you, Steve. But I'm like, I want a t shirt. Have that. some you should yeah yeah you could do that or have them as merch you know and i can I think, sign a bunch yeah yeah got, i think i've got a run of 100 coming for merch that we can yeah would love to have you sign one that the sign them that would be awesome and then um i'm my team's getting some t-shirts made up out of them too i don't know if i told you that Kyle. oh no way that's so exciting yeah. scrooge is such cool. a good guy man he um he's always down to do something for a good cause too you know yeah Awesome. Yeah, the poster is amazing, and you're amazing, Steve, John, and John. You guys are such inspirations, and in, in my life, cool. Steve, can I? Ask I wish you guys. Yeah, was, ask me. Was anything. there was there anything was there anything about like working with us that um that sort of struck you or that like made you want to do the show or um did well, it just happen to be sort of right timing or I'd love to just sort of. I had I liked the when they told me what you guys were doing, 
I had played this show and I was talking about on the DSC show and I had been in, uh, I was in Wilmington, Delaware at the World Cafe and I went blind on stage and I lost my vision. And then um, I kept playing and I was like, I did the same verse of a song four times in a row and people were laughing at me thinking I was kidding like because that's something I might do on stage is do the same yeah. verse four times in a row to kind of mess around and then I was really confused and then I said I couldn't see and then I asked the sound man to turn the lights on and he said they were on and then I got I was like completely confused so I called my buddy. I had my friends call my buddy and my phone. It was a Padres team doctor who I had on. I'm, I, he used to be the team doctor, Dr. Kakahashi. And so I had him in as Dr. Batman because he gave me his bat phone number. So I said, <laughs> call Dr. Batman. And then they called up this guy. And then he said, was it like a curtain coming down? And I said, yeah. And then they rushed me over to Princeton Medical University Center because I was in Wilmington, Delaware. And then the lady at the emergency asked if it was like a curtain coming down. And I was like, where do you people learn this curtain stuff? <laughs> and then they, uh, so then they fast forwarded me ahead of a guy who had like got his fingers cut off with a chainsaw. He had fingers in the bag. Yeah, another guy had an ice pick in the side of his head. And they fast forwarded me in front of those two guys. I think they had gotten in a fight with each other with a chainsaw and an ice pick. <laughs> <laughs> so then I got fast forwarded because of the curtain thing. And then they told me I had had a stroke. And that was why I'd gone blind. So then my vision came back. I was in the stroke ward. And then when my vision came back, I couldn't read. It, the letters made no sense. It looked like it was like hieroglyphics or something to me. Yeah. And then it all came back. But uh, and I went to see this therapist and so I rehabbed a bit and then now I'm out playing and I like it that you guys, I, what piqued my curiosity, that's why I was asking you so many questions because I went and saw a, a mental health person too because I was really scared and I was kind of freaked out and yeah. then they had me do regular therapy and I thought it. I remember how expensive everything was and I was getting charged for stuff. And so um, that was what kind of piqued my curiosity. And then I have this really good friend named uh, Nick Kimmel who got his legs blown off. And I went with him when he did his rehab, but his was paid for yeah. because he was in the military and he was down at a uh, Balboa Naval center. And I got really fascinated watching people rehab and, uh, so that was very interesting to me. And then um, Neil Young's son, Ben, has cerebral palsy. And Neil was doing stuff for United Cerebral Palsy. And we, we lived at Neil Young's ranch and made Jules' hit record years ago called you Were, uh, called Pieces of You. Yeah. And we lived there. And that was the Stray Gators. That was the band. But I got to play guitar with the Stray Gators. And then I got talking to Neil's son, Ben, who can't really communicate except through um touching buttons and stuff and so i thought that was really interesting and then i also had a cousin who died of als and so i was just thinking this all sounded interesting and then my friend eric magnuson called me up who um i know really well and eric played football and uh so that's how i kind of ended up here and nice. then so then phil my manager and Adam were like, hey, you want to do this? So, and then I'm on, mm -hmm. I said, yeah, let's do a Zoom call. Let's get it done. <laughs> I wanted to do it all quicker. I was like, let's get it done right away. Cause I'm like, right. I, I, cause I'm not going to be in San Diego for a while. So I said, let's do the phoner. But I go, I also want to go in because if I go in, I'm on the air for an hour with them. And yeah. I always find I get a lot more done in an hour than I do in five minutes. Cause yeah. I hang out yeah. with them <laughs> and I, I I kind of clog all the airtime on the radio and then people are like, Oh, he's playing, he's playing. And so it's kind of cool. Perfect. Well, that's awesome. So that's how I ended up here. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks to Eric, man. He, I, I grew up with Eric since kindergarten. So I, I, Oh, wow. Yeah. I reached out to him immediately. Um, after talking to John and I'm like, 
do you think you could hit up Steve and make this happen? And cause I saw you didn't have any dates around that time. And I'm like, well, it was meant. I know cause I'm always gone. I know it was <laughs> like meant to always, be. I man. mean, look at this. This is crazy. You got to see this. I mean, if you ever get a chance to come to Cape Breton, do you see the water out there? Oh, oh man. Beautiful. So that is gorgeous. I'm staying right above where I'm playing. <laughs> no, that's the really? best. Yeah, I did two nights. This is my second night. And so I'm staying right above the stage practically. <laughs> and so I was like, this would be the perfect day because tomorrow I'm in Berwick, Nova Scotia, and then I'm on Prince Edward Island. And then I'm flying to Nashville and I'm starting a tour with the Wood Brothers in the Midwest. So it, I'm, I'm doing like 300 shows a year. I don't know why. That's unbelievable. I'm 62. How, how do you, and how do you be 63. To that? Well, Just I mean, I regardless of age. <laughs> no, I know. And I'm going to be 63. And I just love what I do. Like music keeps me really young. Mm -hmm. And I figure I only got about probably 20 years left on this planet. So I want to get all the shows and I can because it's so fun playing. I mean, who knows if I'll live to 80? I might, hopefully. Yeah. But I feel so energetic right now. And then when I hear stories of like the people you're telling me about, that's why I was asking so many questions. And I'm so curious about it because all those day-to-day -day things people go through, it just makes me feel so lucky and so grateful that I have all my faculties about me because yeah. I know what that's like. Like I, I broke my left hand once skiing and that's my guitar fret hand, this hand. And yeah. I had to hire a guy sean rolf to learn all my left hand parts and i would play my right hand parts and we were like <laughs> siamese twins so imagine standing on stage with one guitar my arm around him here he's doing the left hand guitar parts and i'm doing the right <laughs> you're amazing it's, it was hilarious and That's i didn't even cancel i didn't cancel one show <laughs> it was so cool that is unbelievable dude unbelievable <laughs> you're one of the kind so stuff. yeah that's how i'm here <laughs> So I guess I that's how I'm here. So I'm looking forward to meeting you guys in person. Yeah, me too, man. man. Me too. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll do something on the 9th if you're up for it. And then uh, totally want to see Adapt on the 10th. And yeah, as much as you want to hang, like I'm I'm all for it, man. <laughs> I'm around. So let's let's do it. Yeah, maybe we can go to uh, Pacific Coast Grill the night before the show because that's mm -hmm. right near the belly up, you know? Count right. me in. That's right by my house. I'm. I'm all. I'll see if Eric wants to go. You know, Eric, do you know Eric Magnuson, John? I don't know. Kyer does, but you'll I don't. have to meet him though. He played for. Uh, he was a football player. He played 49ers. for the Niners and for. Oh, did he really? Yeah, Michigan and, when they uh, were like the biggest, he's... right? Yeah, University of Michigan. When they were yeah. killing it, so it'd be fun for him to meet us up there, and then, uh, so that would be cool. Nice. But yeah, if there's anything else I can do, let me know. I'll just keep posting about it, you know? Yeah, I think it, it, we'll just keep promoting, posting. And then, um, yeah, I, I also appreciate you taking a few minutes to chat today. I'm glad we got a chance to do this. And Seriously. I think it hopefully gives you a little bit more context on what we actually do. And that's yeah, great to meet you too. Do you need any more? Uh, do you have any more questions or anything? Or do you need anything? I don't think I need anything, Kai, or anything on your end, bud. I just want to say thank you both again so much. This is like a dream come true for me just to have this conversation and for the show. I'm so excited. Every, every Steve Polt show is you never know what's going to happen. So that's the best part. <laughs> you know, I've seen you reading lyrics off your phone. That's a song you just wrote that night. To, I saw your post about last night, uh, making up verses about the Padres game as it's going on. <laughs> so funny. oh my god i always ask them to turn the tv obviously like if you're playing a show you don't want some sports tv on because right. over the years i've played every crappy gig you could have ever <laughs> played on the way up and so it's like a long-running joke you would hate to have some tv on in a big room you're playing that sold out and there's tvs on you want but last night i was like can you put on the padre game? <laughs> and the guy added on and then i was singing and I have this song called Folk Singer. And I started making up verses about what was going on. And I started being the baseball announcer. So I'd be in the middle of the song singing like, you were meant for me and I was meant for you. And I go, and Manny Machano just hits a solo shot. And the Padres <laughs> extend their lead. 
Philadelphia is going back with an even series tied now. And Padres needed to be in this situation. And then I went right back into the verse. It was so fun. That's <laughs> amazing. <man. Nice. laughs> That's unbelievable. <laughs>